all make mistakes, whether it's missing a headshot or not fighting back while carrying a flag. If you want to get better in the game, you can check out my previous Neuro 1 tutorials right here. If you'll stick around with this one, we're exploring most common mistakes old and new players make in Neuro 1. A moment of silence for players robbed from their kills due to the wonky hit registration. It often feels like some opponents are the main characters wearing plot armor, despite your ping being upstanding. It's clear that arrows have some damage priority over melee, so sometimes you need to hit more against certain players, but still, it gets the job done. You can't really say the same thing about melee, though. These players can take 10 katana slices and brush it off like it's just a dusting of snow on their windshield. And trust me, a dusting of snow is not a lot. Spamming melee is most often a big mistake. Cheers to you if that gets you kills, but don't rage quit if it gets you killed instead. If you're cutting your distance with melee in hand towards a projectile armed opponent, he can damage you all the way in, then pull out a melee himself, possibly bigger than yours. So maybe try making it through the battlefield at a more reasonable pace? There are many times where melee applies. If it makes you walk faster, if the opponent is too close for a comfortable headshot, and plenty of other scenarios. My tip is, stay lethal at all times. Don't give your opponent easy frags by walking empty-handed in straight lines. There's a theory that engaging targets from higher altitude gives you better accuracy. It's called gravity. Also makes you more distant from melee range of zombie-like opponents. That's why jumping off that wall on castles to chase someone who just entered your castle is a mistake. You should always appreciate your position on the map, especially when it's earned in a full M8, M6 lobby. Rather than blindly chasing your opponents, which can also get you killed if they set up an ambush around the corner, better reposition yourself to cross their path. Same for engaging flag carrier. You can wait them out to cross your area of influence while dispatching their reinforcements. While on the topic of defending flags, imagine your position paid off. You averted the threat and you jump off the wall to retrieve the flag. BAM! That's when you get killed by a sneaky scout under the wall and he picks up the flag to continue. BAM! Fresh respawn of reinforcements breached your castle while you left your post. BAM! There was a sleeper guest standing on the flag spawn point, so now you have to divert your attention between the next flag carrier and the reinforcements! Quite a headache. One mistake leads to so many bad outcomes. Respawn in this game is quick, but time as a resource is still a thing. You have to account for how much time different actions will cost you, and most importantly, how you can waste your opponent's time. Unreturned flag is a distraction that pushes opponents, makes them more rash but less careful. After 30 seconds, the flag automatically retrieves itself. So if timed right, you can make someone go towards the flag that will disappear in front of them, wasting their time taking that route altogether. Campers at flag spawn are worthless resources to their team while waiting for the flag return. Against tougher opponents, you can let them grab the flag to slow them down for easier takedowns. All of this will depend on where the flag was dropped and who would potentially grab it first. So it's up to you to make all these choices based on your map knowledge. This is subjective, because maybe you're specifically looking for easy games with mindless guests, but if you're lucky, or unlucky, to end up in a tougher lobby, leaving it to find another would be a mistake, despite the team's imbalance. This is a great opportunity for real practice, even if you're a loser. Just focus on defense and combat, try out different loadouts against the overwhelming threat, and you never know! The matchmaking system might take pity on you and just send me onto your team. People who main scout bow report that they have trouble learning other bows, and that's for a good reason. Every bow has its unique specialties and use cases. Different weapon switch times, damage, reload time, effective range, movement speed, the whole nine yards. Bow 1 is an easy mode with all that maxed out and a kinda random spread. Every bow rewards proper aiming. This one does not. The actual beginner's choice should be Sharp Shot Bow 3. Very good overall that lets you practice aim, doesn't allow spam, and makes you very lethal at all ranges. Arrow deals same damage at every load stage. So at close quarters, even if you die to a melee rush, you can still lower their health a lot for someone else to finish. 
Assuming you're playing on keyboard, WASD, this adds up to eight degrees of movement. For any more complicated parkour maneuvers, like strafe jumping, or even dodging projectiles, that's not enough. Try bunny hopping, jumping repeatedly, with melee equipped for speed boost, then hold forward, and control your direction in midair with mouse. You'll see your movement becoming more fluid, and snipers finding it a lot harder to hit you. Once you get comfortable with it, add more direction keys so you can do that backwards and sideways. Makes you a better flag carrier too. It's sad to see flag carriers not fire at chasers because they can't face them while running. So, you've maxed out load on your assault bow too? That's great, partner. You're the fastest gunslinger in this medieval west. Takes you three to four landed hits to down an opponent while you're fully focused on him. Let me propose an alternative. Give up some load in favor of attack or travel. Then you can land a quick hit, preferably headshot, on the first and second opponent, jump behind cover to give their health threshold time to sink in, maybe do some mean shots over some obstacle awaiting these two seconds, then finish them easily with one more shot each. I highly suggest you make a combo with a melee to speed up your kill as well. What about wearables? Plus 20 movement with little to no regen? You aren't that much faster than someone with plus 15, but it'll top his health much faster than you. It's important to retain some balance in your gear, and most importantly, to look good to yourself. An amount of items allows for players to be unique, and not just copy each other because of stats. Even if I have to admit that the choices are unfortunately very limited when you're going to be aiming for a full stat skin like full regen or full speed. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Your skin is gonna look ugly as fuck, but it is what it is. Logic tells you expensive is better. If it was any other free to play game, you might have been right. But fact is, you can do plenty with free gear, or at the price of two hours worth of gameplay. Keep experimenting, there are plenty of melee categories. Poke, bladed, blunt, and each with a light heavy variant, and each has a free cheap representative in the shop. One exception being gatehouse poke gear, its travel abilities are top of the class, but expensive. This reminds me of another shopping related mistake, buying unwanted gear. Turns out your body piece conflicts with your favorite trousers? You can predict how compatible your gear is by hovering the mouse over that gear and inspecting the windowed preview. If your trousers disappear, it means these gear pieces can't coexist on your character. You can't be running around the map without your fighting pants on, so keep that in mind. No pants, no fighting. As for discerning gatehouse heavy from light poke, the heavy one is no longer in the preview. I often see these guests with full king gear unlocked, sometimes even fearless pieces. This implies plenty of hours spent in the game, yet they don't bother saving their progress in the cloud, which is a big mistake. You have to realize how fragile your local data in the web browser profile is. It takes one clear history attempt to undo everything you had going on. Maybe you'll accidentally clear the cookies or someone does it for you to speed up your device or free up some space. Making a Google account isn't that hard, even easier to set up itch.io with any other email provider. For later convenience, set it to I'm 18 years old. Don't use temporary email providers. Set up something legit that you can use for other websites too. I suggest you save your login credentials with KeepPass, which are secured password databases. I know this is a controversial hot take, but it's generally a mistake to link your account with other players' accounts or just sharing your credentials all together. I know, right? Narrow One Clans have popularized the idea that if you join their clan, you'll be granted access to clans' accounts with particularly expensive gear unlocked. It's all cool and dandy until one of 50 account users is caught cheating and gets everyone banned. It's okay to use them out of curiosity, but it's just better to keep your private account yours. Sometimes narrow one developers can be convinced to lift the ban on that account if you're able to find and restrict the member that was hacking in the game, but only if that player admits to it. It's also often that clan members dox themselves by logging in onto shared Google accounts. Their IP and device details are sent to everyone with access to that account.